I wish we could be together in person, but I do want to say that Case Western Reserve University looks forward to hosting the 2021 symposium on our campus. So I know we're going to have an interesting and engaging discussion on a topic that's of great importance to higher education and industry and government aerospace colleagues as well. According to the Aerospace Industry Association, aerospace and defense systems represent $143 billion in exports annually, and that the $86 billion trade surplus is the largest of any U.S. industry. It's truly an economic powerhouse and a major part of keeping the United States globally competitive. And within that context, it's not surprising that four of the top five states with the largest aerospace employee populations also have a NASA research facility with California, Washington, Texas, Alabama, and Ohio in that top five. And every one of those NASA centers is close to a major academic research institution. I'm proud to be able to tell you that. The landscape is changing though, and we need to be prepared. The pandemic and aging workforce are just two of the challenges facing the aerospace industry. We know that innovation emerges from places of diversity and interdisciplinarity. So we're looking for answers to the question of how we can leverage this opportunity to help academia work more effectively with aerospace partners, both in government and in industry. So we're going to talk about that and some other things as well. And I want to introduce our panelists. First, Steve Jerzyk, who is NASA's Associate Administrator. Steve began his career at NASA in 1988 after graduating from the University of Virginia with bachelor's and master's degrees in electrical engineering. His previous roles at NASA included serving as director of Langley Research Center and most recently as Associate, Admi Associate Administrator of the Space Technology Mission Directorate. In that position, he formulated and executed the agency's space technology programs, focusing on developing and demonstrating transformative technologies for human and robotic exploration of the solar system in partnership with industry and academia. We are also joined by Lisa Callahan. Lisa is Vice President and General Manager of the Commercial Civil Space line of business for Lockheed Martin Space. She's responsible for all aspects of the commercial and civil markets in human and robotic deep space exploration, communications, weather, and remote sensing. She's held a number of leadership roles at Lockheed, including Vice President of Corporate Internal Audit, Vice President and General Manager of the Mission Systems and Training Undersea Systems. She graduated from Virginia Tech with a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering. And our third panelist is Colonel Eileen Collins. Colonel Collins was a US Air Force Academy uh, faculty member in mathematics and a T-41 instructor pilot. She was selected for the astronaut program while attending the Air Force Test Pilot School at Edwards Air Force Base in 1990. During her 16 years at NASA, she held a variety of roles, including spacecraft commander, I'm sorry, spacecraft communicator, shuttle branch chief, and astronaut safety branch chief. In addition, as a veteran of four space flights, she's logged 872 hours in space and the only woman to have served as commander of a space shuttle mission. She received a bachelor's degree in mathematics and economics from Syracuse University, a master's degree in operations research from Stanford, and a master's degree in space systems management from Webster University. In retirement, if you want to call it that, she serves on the National Academy's Aerospace Science and Engineering Board. I want to ask each of our panelists to talk a little bit about the work they've been doing in this area and remind everybody in the audience that you're welcome to begin asking questions through the chat function. And we will get to those questions after we hear from our panelists and have a few questions from the moderator, moderator's prerogative. Steve, would you like to start? Sure, Barbara, thank you very much. Uh, it's good to be here today to be on the panel, talk about workforce and education. So at NASA, like most aerospace R&D organizations, our capabilities are our people, our facilities, and our computational tools, methods, and capabilities. And so we've embarked on transforming 
all of those aspects of our capabilities over the last <clears throat> five, six years. Um, and with a focus on how, on the workforce side, on how we recruit, uh, retain, and develop our workforce and, our, and the skills of our workforce to be able to meet the demands of the mission, the current missions, as well as the missions of the future. Um, so that's been a real focus area for us. And um, you know, that involves you know, examining culture, examining the way we train and develop, and examining the use of technologies and how we use technologies, including digital technologies, which are part of what we're looking at on the computational side in, in, a, in a digital transformation initiative that we recently stood up. So lots to do on the workforce side as technologies evolve, as the way we work evolves. And we do have an aging workforce. Um, like a lot of aerospace or organizations, I was kind of hired in at the front end of uh, a hiring wave in the 1980s going into the early 90s. So my cohort, I'm the, I'm the uh, elder statesman of that group. So we're starting to think about what we're going to do in the next phases of our life. And so we need to have a strategy for succession planning, which we are uh, putting a more structured strategy in place. On the education side, you know, the, the lead for the agency is the Office of STEM Engagement. Um, they put a strategy in place and a framework in place, and they manage some programs for us um, uh, at the, with the, uh, our intern program as well as our university programs. But as important, they work with the other mission areas, Aeronautics Research, Space Technology, Science, and Unit Exploration Operations to make sure we have an integrated set of edu education activities across the entire agency. So for example, in science, all our science missions have a component, an edu education and outreach component, and we engage uh, you know, mostly university, uh, undergraduates, graduates, and even postdoctoral uh, folks in those programs. And then in Space Tech and Aero, we have some university-focused research initiatives. Um, and in UN exploration, we really use the International Space Station as a focal point to engage uh, students K through 12, as well as um, at the university level. Um, so lots going on, and I look forward to the, uh, the questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Lisa, let's hear from you. Thank you. Well, and thank you for the introduction, and it's really great to be a part of this conference. Um, this is a really important topic. Uh, I think if you talk to anyone in the commercial or aerospace domain right now, we're all in a war fighting for talent, uh, particularly the STEM talent that we need to do our business. Um, and traditional STEM skills, uh, science, technology, engineering, and math are required in just about every industry right now. When I joined the company, STEM students, graduates went to high tech companies. Now every industry needs those types of skills. So it really is driving us to be very innovative and creative for how we build partnerships with universities and bring students in as early as high school and in college for intern opportunities so they get to understand the opportunities that would be in, in our industry. But it also provides us with an opportunity to think about leveraging other degreed candidates where they bring different skills and experiences because they've grown up in a high tech world using technologies and they can play a role in our workforce as well. So I'm really excited to talk about what we're doing at Lockheed Martin, as well as what the larger aerospace industry is doing to meet our workforce needs. So thanks for having me. Thanks, Lisa. Eileen. Yeah, well, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I wanted to talk about or just give you an idea of what I'm doing right now with the National Space Council. I'm an advisor to the National Space Council, and I think uh, most folks know what it is, but just briefly, the National Space Council is a cabinet level council chaired by the Vice President, Mike Pence. And some of the members are, uh, for example, the Department of State, Department of Defense, Transportation, Energy, the NASA Administrator, and many others. Their job is to coordinate space policy on a national level because it covers so many uh, different disciplines. So, they have asked for an advisory group, which we call the user advisory group, and it's made up of six committees. We don't have any power to actually do anything. We just advise the National Space Council. <clears throat> so I'm here today as the chairman of the Education and Outreach Committee of the user advisory group. And I wanted to give you an idea of uh, what we do and what specifically we have been doing over the past six months or so. So 
We have a mission statement, it's twofold. The first one has to do with education, which as you would guess is basically recommending ways to improve our country's education system to support the future space workforce. And the second part of our mission is the outreach part. And that's partly what I'm doing today, but it's collaborating with different stakeholders throughout the space program to find out what are your issues uh, not just having to do with education and workforce, but what are the issues overall? And if it's an issue that doesn't have to do with my committee, we can pass it on to one of the other five committees. So that's our mission statement. We try to meet about once a month. Um, I have six uh, members on my committee. And I just like to go over the last, uh, just the titles of the last five meetings we've had. So if you have questions for me on any one of these, I'd be happy to answer. Um, our uh, first meeting this uh, half of the year was with the National Science Foundation uh, Director for Education, Karen Marangel. She talked to us about a study that was published by the National Science Board in September of 2019 called the Skilled Technical Workforce. And you can look that up if you just Skilled Technical Workforce National Science Board, that report will come right up and you can see what some of the issues are that they've identified. Um, our next meeting was in April, and it was with two U.S. representatives, uh, Jim Banks from Indiana and Andy Kim from New Jersey. Uh, one's Republican, one's Democrat. They submitted a bipartisan bill called the STEM Core Bill, and you can also look that up. And if you have questions on what the STEM, I'm not going to go into it now in my opening statement, but if you're interested in what that bill is doing, I'd be happy to uh, answer that in the questions later. Our meeting in May was with Arizona State University and uh, President Michael Crow. And the reason we wanted to speak with him was one of our number one issues on the committee is why is there such a high dropout rate in the universities across the country of first year engineering students? Um, it's almost a tragedy. Some schools have up to you know 50% of their engineering students decide to leave engineering and go to some other field of study. And why would they be doing that when, you know, initially their passion was engineering and something along the way made them change their mind. So he had a very successful program of retention. Over 90% of their students uh, stay in engineering. So we uh, wanted to talk with him about what was successful. And again, I can answer questions on that. In June, we talked to Space Camp. Um, we wanted to find out, you know, what is going on along the uh, um, elementary, uh, junior high, high school level. Uh, their director of uh, vice president for education and vice president for marketing and strategic development. They are a, uh, I want to say, uh, just a blessing to the uh, space workforce because how many people do you know out there that went to space camp and were inspired to go on into uh, aerospace because of their experience there and what they do that's successful. And then this month, actually this will be tomorrow, we're talking with Dr. Vic McCreary from the National Science Board on historically black colleges and universities and their contribution to STEM, specifically uh, the space workforce. The user advisory group has a public meeting July 30th that uh, you're welcome to join. So just um, in closing, I wanna say um, I'm happy to answer any questions you have on you know, what we're doing with the National uh, Space Council, but also take suggestions. I'm going to try to look at all of your questions afterwards because it's uh, my job to do the outreach and find out what is on your mind. So if we don't have time to answer all your questions, I still want to look at what those questions are and make note of, of that uh, to make sure that we're not missing anything. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eileen. Well, let's start by talking about the aging workforce and the impact that it's having. Steve on NASA, Lisa, as you see it on, on Lockheed and, and other, other similar companies. And Eileen, as you look at the whole spectrum, how do you, how do you all see that? Steve, why don't we start with you? Yeah, so we, we, um, we have not seen a mass exodus of people from the agency, you know, we're kind of, um, it's been, our attrition rate is actually uh, been fairly low, but we expect that to pick up as uh, people reach retirement age. 
And so, you know, we need to develop people on multiple tracks, right? So there's, we need to develop um, organizational leaders, uh, particularly in um, engineering and uh, things like engineering and safety and mission assurance. Um, and we need to develop program project managers. Uh, we need to develop the technical workforce that we need, including senior technical people and senior leaders. And then um, we also need to develop um, people who can um, backfill in our mission support areas in things like financial management and human capital management, and, uh, and particularly in IT, which could be a really challenging field and very competitive field to recruit in. So um, that is the, and then even within engineering, that's the great thing about um, aerospace is it is very multidisciplinary. Uh, we need scientists and engineers across multiple disciplines um, to accomplish engineering, manufacture, integrate, and test you know, our space systems. And so we need people from a very broad range of backgrounds and skills. And so um, we, we, we are definitely focusing on knowledge capture and knowledge management, and not only in systems, but also in making sure our um, experienced folks are mentoring our our, um, our folks as they come into the agency and progress in their career. So mentoring is very important. Uh, job experience is very important. Formal training is, is very important and developmental assignments. I served on main, many uh, center level teams and agency level teams to attack, take advantage of opportunities and attack, um, attack problems over my career. And those were very variable and broadening my experience. And so we're really focused on those areas of on the job training, formal training, uh, mentoring, and developmental assignments to make sure we have a cadre of people coming up to replace those who are getting ready to retire. Steve, do you think about a timeline when you might be losing a number of people, a large number of people to retirement? So a time horizon for getting all these new people with all the skills you talked about ready to yep. step up when, the t when that time comes. Yeah, I keep saying it's gonna be next year, but I keep being wrong. So it's hard to, it's hard. We keep, I think we are seeing attrition rates, you know, come up, but I think over the next decade, we're going to see a large percentage turnover in, uh, in the NASA workforce. Lisa, what are you seeing at, at your part of Lockheed? Uh, thanks. Um, you know, we have uh, four generations in our workforce right now. And what it may be surprising to folks is that more than 50% of our workforce now are millennials. So um, while we do have folks that are retirement eligible, um, we have a large percentage of our population that is um, 10, 15 years into the workforce and younger. Um, and so uh, we really are finding that this level of diversity in terms of those different generations playing together um, is helping us to um, improve our innovation as well as improve our de decision making. And I think there's research out there that shows that that level of diversity is really impactful to your business moving forward. Um, and making sure, I think the thing we wor work on is uh, helping to facilitate an understanding and respect for each other and that we have these differences and different ways of doing things and really leveraging that to our advantage. Um, one of the examples that I would use, and Steve mentioned mentoring, uh, we do a lot of mentoring, but we also incorporate reverse mentoring. Uh, I can personally share a story where I had an early career new hire come in and be my mentor to help me with some of the technologies. And as we're dealing with things like COVID right now and technology is so critically important for us to collaborate, uh, I needed help understanding how to use a Slack channel and what that really meant and things like that. So um, we're finding that we can do a lot of the knowledge transfer through those mentoring relationships, but the reverse mentoring uh, where the, the younger generation helps the older generation to understand some of the new technologies and collaborations has been really um, critically important to us as well. And I think we see that across the space industry. Lisa, I'm glad you mentioned reverse mentoring because as a university president, I've always been fortunate to have these young students who are very good at the latest technology and who, who work for us in a variety of roles that, who can be helpful in that regard. So yeah, that's I'm always sure been a good As powerful as I did to really help you uh, uh, bring up the uh, productivity for your own job. <laughs> <laughs> it's always been a huge help. Eileen, how do you see the aging workforce when you look over the, the whole sector? Well, you know, I'm not sure how much I have to add uh, to Steve and Lisa's comments. I agree 100% with what they're saying. 
Um, my, my first thought or contribution here was um, that those that, um, I hate, almost hate to use the word aging because it almost sounds bad. I like to say, well, these are people are more experienced and then you've got the uh, not as experienced, but um, I think, you know, having a succession plan. So if you're one of the more experienced workers, um, it's your responsibility to have a succession plan. Who is going to replace you? I know that's hard to do, but it should actually be a corporate, uh, it should be a responsibility of the organization to make sure that each employee has a, uh, another employee that would be their successor, even if they had to leave at a moment's notice, you know, they you know, got the virus or something, or maybe they had to leave, uh, they're going to another job, have a replacement ready to go so you don't have a big gap there. The other comment is on the astronaut program. I, I think back to, you know, the early days of Mercury and uh, uh, the Gemini, even the Apollo program, the astronauts were young, they flew in their 30s you know, sort of their late 30s. And then they had, you know, these 50 years left of their life that they were able to share with us all of their experiences and everything that they've learned. But as time has gone on, uh, the, astronaut, uh, the astronauts have, um, they're flying older. You know, the more recent mission, I think uh, one astronaut in his late 40s, one in his early 50s. So, you know, we've had the aging workforce, I want to say in the astronaut program also, and I think it's I think it's important that we get the young people up in space too, because whether they stay at NASA or go work somewhere else, having that experience of been in space, you have all this road ahead of you where you can contribute either in private industry or in the government or in academia. Um, but that's my that's just a personal opinion. Um, but NASA likes to fly the more experienced astronauts, I think, because every mission seems to be more important than the last one. So I like your point about not referring to aging, but referring to the more experienced. I, I, in fact, I, I'm liking it better every day. And I, think, I think that's the right way to look at it. And I'll tell you, in, in our business, we definitely see people working longer, being productive longer, because they're healthy longer. And that, those, are, those are good things. But at the same time, we know people will want to retire and, and do other things. Retire like you have, Eileen, where you're taking on other responsibilities. So we've talked about generational diversity, but I do want to talk about diversity in, in other ways as well. So in an industry that has not been as, as, um, as, as a great a place for women, for, for people of color to go, that is changing, at least we see it changing a bit. Lisa, from your perspective, how do you see that in industry? Is it changing and is it moving fast enough? It's definitely not moving fast enough. I'll just start with that. Um, you know, I think if I, well, I won't tell you when I started, but if I go back to when I started um, with that great experience I have not age, um, there weren't a lot of women in the workplace, I, I, it was not unusual for me to find myself as the only woman in a room at a time. So that has definitely improved. Um, but I would argue we've stalled out. I think women represent about 23% of the aerospace industry right now. Um, and, you know, we represent 51% of the population. So that doesn't really seem like um, it's moving as fast enough as it needs to. And people of color um, is even a worse statistic. So um, you know, in industry, what we've had to do is we talked about partnering with universities, um, particularly partnering with those um, uh, lower represented uh, universities, uh, uh, universities that, that specialize or have um, relationships with people of color and really helping to try to recruit those. But, but candidly, um, to retain those people, you have, they have to be able to feel like they're a part of that workforce, right? They have to feel comfortable in that workforce that they're uh, voices are being heard and they they need to be able to look up and see themselves uh, and the growth opportunities that are there. So we've had a tremendous focus on diversity and inclusion and really trying to um, look to improve those numbers over time with those relationships with the partnering, but also um, in programs that we do uh, internal to make sure that our leaders understand the importance of diversity, understand what it means to have privilege and making sure that all, everybody's voice is heard and people can bring their whole self to work when they come. So we're seeing that improve and the retention numbers are improving. We just now need to get the pipeline to continue to grow so we can increase those numbers. We, we need to do more. And we've got a responsibility in there too to try to bring that pipeline to 
you and Steve to you. What's going on in NASA in this regard in, in terms of diversity of the workforce? I'm sure you've seen some changes over over the years of your career there. Yeah, I would. Uh, I've seen changes definitely, but I would be at least. Uh, um, I would like to see the change pick up. <laughs> I don't think we're moving fast enough to have a, a, a diverse workforce. You know, a workforce that um, at least represents the relevant uh, re you know, the relevant civilian labor force. Um, you know, as we compare to other like organizations, but eventually one that mirrors society in general. And so we have work, we absolutely have work to do there. Diversity and inclusion has been a focus for our leadership team. Um, it's in all our performance plans every year and all my direct reports, you know, center directors and associate administrators, they have to tell me what they've done over the previous year with their teams to advance diversity and inclusion. Now, a couple of thoughts. I mean, first, um, you know, there is this thought out there that science, technology, and engineering, and math is hard, and it's not for everybody, and there's some stereotypical type person that could be successful in STEM, and we really do need to break that down. Um, you know, I was just totally incensed when my uh, daughter's middle school math teacher, you know, had kind of pigeonholed her and told her she was not good in math, and she would never be good in math. That just drives me crazy that a teacher would tell that to any student, particularly a female student, right? Um, I don't know if it was conscious bias or unconscious bias, but, you know, and then she got it in her head that she wasn't good at math and I had to try to overcome that, you know, that, so I think we really need to, to, um, give a sense to students as they come up that they can see a future in STEM. It's hard, but they can do it. They absolutely can do it. And, and I think in that regard, role models are really important. I think, I, you know, Eileen's a role model, Lisa's a role model. And so I think seeing people who that have been successful that look like them, that act like them is also really, really important. So we've tried to have, uh, have a really robust outreach effort of a diverse cadre of people at NASA out in K through 12 and universities, right? So people can see, hey, somebody like me, I can be successful in, in STEM. And then we've really tried to, uh, and we're still trying to um, broaden our recruitment beyond the traditional places where we recruit, <laughs> including HBCUs and MSIs, right? Um, so, because, you know, the hiring managers have their, they don't get many hires every year, the branch chiefs. And so they tend to go to the same places all the time, the places they feel comfortable recruiting. And we're trying to break that down and recruit from a much more diverse set of uh, organizations to create a pipeline of diverse candidates so we can diversify our workforce. And then I, I couldn't agree with Lisa more, and I lean more about um, how, uh, you know, the power of diversity diversity of experience, diversity of thought, diversity of backgrounds in being able to come up with more innovative, more effective solutions to meet the challenges um, of the future. And that, so that's really kind of a business case for diversity and inclusion and one of the reasons why we focused on it. Yeah, the business case is clear. Eileen, you've been a role, you've been called a role model, you are a role model and you've been a pioneer. Um, what thoughts do you have as we think about diversity and its importance in in making sure that we're creating a workforce that's truly going to be able to meet the needs of the future. Yeah, so I think, you know, it's all about problem solving. But let me say, first of all, Steve hit a chord with me. When I hear somebody say to a boy or a girl, you're not good at math, I just, I, I, it just really upsets me. I used to teach math at the sixth grade level. I taught at the Air Force Academy. Um, I really believe everybody can do math. Not everybody learns at the same rate. And the child's brain develops, the ch children's brains develop at different rates. So if you can't do math in very well, say in fourth grade, that doesn't mean you're not gonna be able to do it well in fifth grade or in high school or even in college. Everybody can learn math. It's about logic, it's about problem solving. And no matter where you go to work, if you know how to solve problems, that's the kind of employee that employers want. So on the diversity side, boys and girls, whatever uh, background you're from, they have got to get the message that everybody can learn math. Now, as one example, um, when we spoke to the president of Arizona State University, he has been very successful. Um, they have a, a, a large Native American uh, population of students out there, and he's been very successful getting them into STEM fields and keeping them there um, by, by having uh, groups where they can feel like they belong. And there's other people that are like them, not everybody, of course you want diversity, but um, they get the message from their faculty, you can do it. And 
I think, you know, the, the mentorship and, you know, uh, companies, government agencies like NASA and uh, various aerospace companies, get your employees out there, give them, you know, an hour off uh, once a month or so to go into a school, if the school's ever open again, <laughs> but get them out into the schools or get them on social media, um, connecting with teachers, talking to the kids. Um, I think this is going to, and, and flat out tell them, girls can do math and, you know, people from all backgrounds can do math. So anyway, it hit a chord with me and it's kind of a passion of mine. I just hate to see us losing young people because they get the feeling that they can't do it because I know they can. Jim Way, we promised to have questions from the audience and Jim is moderating our questions out there. So let me turn to him and see if there are any questions. Excellent, thank you very much, Barbara. Um, let's see, I'm trying to see, it doesn't really matter much, but uh, I'm trying to get myself on uh, video here. But um, anyway, uh, our first question uh, comes from a teacher. Um, she is an elementary educator um, and definitely integrates um, STEAM, STEM throughout her content areas. Uh, she notes that by fourth grade, one out of three children have decided science isn't for them uh, if they haven't been exposed, excited, or engaged with science. Do you all have any advice for educators and or primary students and programs for the, for the younger students um, to promote it and continue it as they go through middle uh, high school and college. Anybody take that? I, I can, uh, I'll take that. Um, so both of my children now have graduated from high school and are in college, but um, I remember when they were going through a school, um, the teachers that I saw that, that really engaged them the most and got them excited about what they were doing were the ones that made the lesson they were learning kind of hands-on and um, useful in something that's an everyday world. And I think the teachers that can take a concept, a mathematical concept, the science concept and chemistry or whatever, and then show how it's applicable to a real world um, situation or um, take that, that, what, that learning and apply it to a real world situation are the ones that I saw my kids get captured by the most. So. I think doing that, uh, reaching out to companies like uh, Lockheed Martin or other industries that are in the high tech field. Um, we have a whole employee engagement team that just loves to come into school and work with students and help them on projects and things like that. Um, those are opportunities that I think teachers have uh, to help with those things as well. Yeah, I'd just like to add to what Lisa said. So the answer what I would have given is exactly Lisa's answer is people that show, uh, teachers who show how to apply math and science tend to get the most um, enthusiasm from students. And so in our Office of Education, we have a whole set of lesson plans for teachers, um, K through 12, that they can utilize in the classroom that take some of the aerospace you know, problems and challenges and breaks them down to the right level and allows you to teach science and math um, and show how it's applied and used. And so there are resources, NASA does have, the also Veggie uh, of uh, STEM engagement does have resources out there for teachers K through 12. And if, if I could add to that, I'm a big promoter of reading books. I know it, it might sound like it's old fashioned to read books nowadays, but if these kids can read, get lost in a book on science fiction or, um, you know, even watching movies, getting them, ex you know, seeing something in, you know, reading something, using your imagination. That's how I got interested. Um, I used to read fourth grade. In fact, I remember my mother taking me to the library when I was a little kid and I just checked out books on all kinds of science. And that's how I got interested. So it might sound a little bit old fashioned, but I think if, and I think it's okay for the kids to have screen time, but I think they can maybe diversify it a little bit with, with books. Jim, other questions from the audience? Uh, sure, we've got a couple others. Um, so this one comes from a college student. Um, as an incoming engineering freshman on an aerospace track, what would be the most unique piece of advice um, that you could give him to have a really meaningful and impactful role in the industry, you know, to best prepare him, what he should focus on in college to best prepare him for a role in the uh, industry afterwards? 
I'll start. Um, I think uh, one piece of advice, advice I would give is just diversifying your studies um, and getting a broad set of experiences. And then the second piece that I think is important is to find opportunities to do internships in the summertime and really get out to different industries so you can and get a chance to see how what you're learning is applied. So when you go back to school, you understand that application, but also just to get an idea of what gets you excited? What do you have passion over? Um, by, so trying different industries in your internships is a great way to try things out before you get into your formal adult life in a permanent role. Yeah, I would say, yeah, I would say yeah, internships are really important and try internships in, with different organizations in different areas within aerospace. Um, again, this to echo what uh, Lisa's saying, to see what you like, what, where your passion is, um, and that'll really help you decide um, what you want to do um, post your undergraduate studies. And the second thing also I think is to um, learning how to work in teams is really important. You know, all, all, all or most of our projects are, uh, have fairly large teams, right? Our flight projects, it, aerospace is absolutely a team sport. And so um, I think through your, uh, through your project work with classes, um, where you're working in project teams, or through getting involved in competitions and other activities outside the classroom where you have to lead a team or work in a team environment and getting that experience, I think is really important. And maybe I, I agree with all that. The only thing I might add, you know, definitely internships, team experiences, um, don't uh, discount using your professor or assistant professor. Um, back when I was teaching at the Air Force Academy, I have students come up to me after class and ma'am, I don't understand this or, you know, why are we learning that? Or, you know, just take advantage of your professor. Some of them, they like to hide out in their office. I, because I know, people just do that and they keep their door shut but try to catch the professors and you know they need to get feedback from you on the way the students are perceiving the classes that they're taking and that was the only thing I, I have to add great comments all of you let's talk a little bit about the skills gap because we read about that from time to time is there a skills gap do you see it with employees do you see it more with the younger people coming in and and if you see it, where is it? Those of us who are in education, we need to know so we can help address it with you. Uh, maybe I can jump on that Definitely. one, a skills gap. I just say right off the bat, um, cyber skills, data analysis, um, from what we're seeing, um, there's, a, there's a shortage of this, I would say in aerospace and in the Department of Defense. I think a lot of folks with the kind of skills that will be used in the future for artificial intelligence and, and that uh, type of futuristic uh, innovation that we're doing. A lot of them go to uh, private industry where maybe they can be paid more or maybe they're just recruited harder. Um, I, I'm not promoting the STEM core bill. I'm not really in a position to do that, but the STEM core bill that was that is in Congress right now would actually pay for two years of college education for students to get these skills where there's a, a big gap in our country and, but then they would have to work four years for the Department of Defense afterwards. So um, that's my short answer. I'll turn it over to Lisa or Steve. Yeah, I would, I would agree with you, Eileen. I think um, cyber is definitely a skills gap that we're seeing. Um, we can't hire enough cyber engineers. Uh, and then um, the same as what you said in terms of um, AI, analytics, autonomy. Um, that's a, a big area for the future, I think, that we'll see across everything that we do. Um, those would be two big areas that I would highlight. Steve, what do you see at NASA? Yeah, the only thing I would add is, um, so yeah, in aerospace, uh, so there, there are a lot, there's lots of work being done in autonomous systems, right? Um, across all industries. Uh, and the one, and the, the one challenge we have there is to develop folks who have the skill to develop very highly reliable autonomous systems and how we, test and verify those systems is very challenging because a highly autonomous system gets very complex and sort of non-deterministic. And then our classic methodology for verification and validation of those systems is does, does, doesn't work, you know, to just run test case after test case after test case. There are just too many branches in the 
in the autonomous logic to, to, to validate the system. So there's a bunch of different, you know, skills around that that we need to develop not, for not only autonomous systems, but how do we make these autonomous systems very highly reliable? Um, because we need, we need the high reliability both in um, uh, air, you know, aviation systems as well as in space systems. Um, we, all, we seem to need the combination of um, science, engineering, and uh, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. You know, we need that, we, you know, it's difficult to take an AI ML person and put them into a science organization and figure out how to apply those capabilities and tools to do research in a different way and vice versa. So it's that, you know, multi, I mean, that, that multidisciplinary skill set. Uh, you either have, you know, deep knowledge in the science field um, and an IT, AI, ML background or deep knowledge in the engineering field with an I, I, AI, ML backgrounds because I really think that AI and machine learning is going to transform the way we do research. We're going to move from hypothesis, experiment, validate, retry to, hey, we have these petabytes of data that we've collected from these space observatories over decades. How can we use AI and ML to just mine that data and make discoveries that are data-driven versus, uh, you know, hypothesis and experiment-driven? Jim, let me come back to you. Those are all great comments. Thanks to all of you. Jim, I want to give the audience more time to ask questions of these great panelists. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, our next question uh, comes from somebody named Gabrielle. Um, how do NASA, private companies, and academia view the education level of uh, students? So are students with bachelor's, master's, or PhDs, you know, is any one more necessary than the other for the near-term workforce? Steve, you want to start with NASA? Yeah, I'll, I'll start on that. See, it depends on um, what you want to do and where you work at NASA. Um, so in science research and engineering research, um, you know, we tend to look more for PhD students and you know, PhD candidates. Um, hopefully they've come up through an internship or a, um, a, a fellowship, you know, at NASA. So they get to know NASA and see what, how they fit in at NASA and we get to know them and make sure that we place them in the most appropriate role. So if it's on the research side, it tends to be, um, tends to be PhDs, but on the, on the engineering side, working on a, say a flight project, um, a bachelor's, you know, we hire a lot of folks with bachelor's degrees uh, and they come out and they get, um, you know, great experience on projects. And then they decide whether that project based design, manufacturing integration and test project based work is where they want to head. Um, and they might get a, a master's in their discipline or maybe a master's in systems engineering. Um, or they decide maybe, hey, research is for them and we can support them in going back and getting an advanced degree, a master's or a PhD. Um, so it really depends on, um, you know, what they, want, what they want to do and where we have the need at NASA because we do everything from basic research to, you know, building, flying and operating, uh, you know, um, very complex space systems. Lisa, what do you see at Lockheed? Yeah, I, I would say it mirrors exactly what Steve just said. I think um, in some of our advanced technology labs where we do a lot of early on research, we tend to hire those with masters or PhDs, but I would say the predominance of our college hires are, are just bachelor degrees. Uh, and the only other point I would make to Steve's point is that a lot of industry, I know Lockheed does and I know uh, our peer companies do as well, will actually pay for your education to go back and get a master's. And so there's an opportunity there for students to uh, join in a bachelor's degree and then maybe in the evenings, because there's so much online learning these days, be able to get a master's degree and actually have the company help support them financially to get to that. And then they'll have a little bit of work under their belt to know where they want to go. To Steve's point, is it in systems engineering? Is it in engineering management? Do they want an MBA associated with that? Um, they can, they can figure out where their passion is and when, what the next degree is they want to get. It's great. I think it's great because it gives people an opportunity to work a little bit and, and think about what they want to do and what they want to get out of the next phase of the education, but also a way to help pay for that. So okay. great advice from both of you. Eileen, anything to add? Uh, to yeah, that? yeah, just real quick. In my case, I got my bachelor's degree. I went to work for seven years. Um, I joined the Air Force. As I approached my six year point, I knew I wanted to teach. So I, I went back to get my master's degree. It you know, took 
between a year, year and a half. And then I went and I taught for three years. So um, that worked best for me. And I will make one other comment. Uh, the astronaut program uh, for decades just required a bachelor's degree. Well, this last cycle for the first time, they changed it to a master's degree. And I'm not sure why they did that. Because in my opinion, an astronaut needs a bachelor's degree. Um, you need to have, you know, mostly astronauts need hands-on skills, whether you're doing maintenance or you're running experiments, you, you need to be a, you need to be able to work with your hands and do things fairly quickly, shift gears from one thing to another. Um, you know, but, but I, as far as a, the master's degree, I think I, I sort of suspect, and don't hold me to this, but maybe there were so many people that were applying and they were only selecting people with masters and PhDs, you know, masters and above, that they decided to change the requirement for that reason. Um, but, uh, but again, I agree with uh, the comments that, you know, it's really uh, what works for you. We are trying to, uh, on the uh, uh, National Science Board, if I could uh, make a comment about the report, not every person even, need, even needs to go to college. Um, something called the skilled technical workforce. People that, you know, the welders, the machinists, um, they can you know, do computer technology that maybe requires a, a community college degree. Uh, you know, in the shuttle program, we had people that worked on the tiles. You know, they did not need, they didn't even need a college degree, but those are skills that are definitely needed in the aerospace industry. And you can, you can have a, a great job, you can advance and be promoted, um, you know, electrician. And you can make some pretty good money doing these things too. So uh, you don't even need a college degree. You just have to have a goal, something you want to do. Good to know. Jim, other questions? Yeah, I think I've got maybe uh, uh, one more for y'all. Um, okay. So um, let's see. Uh, so this one uh, was the most upvoted. Um, and again, it goes back to advice. So uh, what advice do you uh, give to students um, or do you recommend teachers give to students um, to best prepare them for careers in STEM? Should they be a generalist? Should they be a specialist? And I think Lisa, you talked to that a little bit before, um, but I didn't know if we wanted to cover that a little bit more or move on to another question. Yeah, I, I still stick by my answer. I think, um, I, don't, I think getting um, a broad education and a broad perspective on things and then finding an area that maybe uh, is the most exciting to you and diving a little deeper into that area. So, um, but, but starting off broad, so you get a broad experience space and you can really see what the opportunities are and what the areas are that excite you. And then diving in a little bit more into some of those areas that excite you. Um, even from a um, broader education perspective than just purely technical, really having that broader perspective. The thing that I find interesting is that there is a lot that we do and we can innovate in engineering, um, but policies and other things will inhibit that from ever going to market. And so, um, really understanding um, broader than just a technology area. You can have the best technical solution, but it may go nowhere if you don't understand it from a, uh, how to communicate it, how, how to put a business plan together, or how to um, set policies so that it could support your idea. Steve, advice on that? Um, yeah, I agree. You know, uh, getting a broad experience in education as a foundation, I think is really important even if you're gonna decide you're gonna be like a world recognized expert in a field. You're gonna be really narrow and really deep because we need you know, the world recognized experts in their field too, right? And, uh, but that broad and foundation will help you even in being an effective expert if you go say on to be a, you know, get a PhD and be a researcher in an area. Um, you know, my strength, I, I didn't gravitate towards that. I gravitated towards uh, learning a little bit about a lot of things. And so I became a systems engineer, you know, and I really like um, working with all the discipline engineers, you know, guidance, navigation, control, and structures and mechanisms and avionics and power and connecting the dots across the systems. And so and I think that helped me in becoming a leader, uh, a good manager, a leader too, that being able to connect the dots, that systems engineer experience, because I've been a manager or a leader for 23 years now at NASA since 1997. And you know, my biggest challenge since then has been people engineering, you know, and, and building teams and dry, leading change and motivating people and inspiring people. And so those, eventually those are the, those leadership skills are skills you need to develop 
um, whether you're leading a small team or leading a large organization. And that's really important over time too. Eileen, I'll turn to you and then I'm gonna let Alan ask the last question. Uh, sure. Um, yeah, I, I would say a little of both, but whatever you do, you're gonna start out as a specialist, most likely. If you're in college right now, your first job out of college, you're gonna be a specialist. And I encourage you to know your job better than anybody else. I think it's always good advice you become in your first job, you'd be so specialized that your company goes to you when they need to know something. You're the expert, you're the go-to person. They know your name because you are the expert in this area. And then as you go through your career, you'll become more of a generalist. So that's all I have to add. Alan, you get the last question today. All right, the last question. Uh, a, a little um, history, back when we were starting the uh, checkout systems in shuttle, the senior managers, I says the older managers, the senior managers were really surprised at the need for uh, gamesman type skills. They were really surprised at how the younger generation that knew how to play video games could go in and control the software and do the software interface uh, better than they could, even though they were the senior guys were much better engineers. The younger guys were just faster and more adept at communicating with the computers. That was a really big surprise to a lot of the people around KSC at that time. So as we move forward in the different areas, have you been surprised at skills that the younger generation is bringing that you did not know that you needed, but now you find are very beneficial? I'll start with that. Absolutely. Um, and I think I talked about it earlier, the diversification of, you know, earlier careers and uh, mid careers and uh, more experienced folks is really important to our workforce and our, to our business and the mentoring and reverse mentoring that we've done. Um, again, my personal experience is I learned about things from a reverse mentoring relationship that really increased my productivity and my team's productivity. Um, based on something that uh, literally an early career brought in to me and uh, and talked to me about. So um, I think that's that your, that whole comment is really selling the business case for why we need diversity. Uh, and I think there's some experienced folks that could help with, um, you know, the hard knocks of what they've learned to kind of shape some of those uh, ideas that the early career folks might bring in. So uh, definitely uh, some uh, definitely a reason for why we need that diversity. Yeah, obviously, I've been really impressed with uh, early career folks who have come in with their use of digital tools and technologies because they've grown up using those their whole life. I mean, it's not something they had to come to work to learn how to use. It's been just part of their life, smartphones and laptops and, and the web, et cetera. And so it's funny when, you know, they come to work and they don't have necessarily the tools at NASA that they had at a university or have at home. And we're starting to scratch our head and go, well, why is that? Why don't we have these same tools at, at NASA? And that was one of the motivations for digital transformation. The other thing I love about, uh, we, we have this early career initiative where we pull teams of early career people together to work on a project with mentoring. And I love that they are kind of um, un- inhibited by the past, <laughs> right? I mean, experience is good, but experience can also hold you back with respect to pursuing an innovative idea. And they're like, hey, we have this idea. We want to build this thing. And nobody in the group says, oh, we tried that before. We shouldn't do that. They just, we just let them go and build it and try it. And sometimes they succeed and sometimes they fail, but they learn a lot. So I just kind of love that they're willing to try stuff versus, you know, me who's like, oh man, we tried that before. It'll never work, you know, and, and, and I'm inhibited because of the, the past actually, my experience actually holds me back. So I thought that's been really interesting. We are out of time. Alan, I want to thank you for pushing to have this session as part of the symposium. Eileen, Steve, Lisa, thank you for the very thoughtful contributions you made to our discussion. At Case Western Reserve, we look forward to having you on campus, actually, for the 2021 symposium. Thank you all. Thanks, Barbara. Thanks, Barbara.